It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Leith Anderson. Dr. Anderson is the president of the National Association of Evangelicals, which is an organization representing more than 40 denominations and more than 45,000 churches. For over 65 years, the NAE has been committed to the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ, engagement in political action, and facilitating evangelical unity, witness, and cooperation. The Free Methodist Church was one of the original founding partners of the NAE. Roberts Wesleyan College is also a member. From 1977 until 2011, Leith also served as senior pastor of Wooddale Church, a congregation of nearly 5,000 members located in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. He graduated from Moody Bible Institute, Bradley University, Denver Seminary, and Fuller Theological Seminary. He has written articles published in many periodicals, and he has authored 11 best-selling books. He has hosted a nationally syndicated radio ministry called Faith Matters, broadcast on radio stations since 1999. Leith is a worldwide speaker, traveling extensively on all seven continents. He is frequently interviewed and quoted by publications and broadcasts, including Christianity Today, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Newsweek, PBS, the BBC, NBC News, NPR, and CNN. He has served on President Obama's Faith Advisory Council and has represented the faith and commitments of evangelical Christians to the world's leaders on the international stage for decades. His proximity to power, however, has not diminished Leaf's lifelong passion for the marginalized and underserved people of our world. Rather, Leith has had an extraordinary opportunity to challenge the systems of the 21st century with a call to justice for the oppressed, increased aid to the poor, and liberation for those in bondage. Firmly rooted in the scriptural story of freedom and the redeeming love of Jesus Christ, Leith unapologetically believes that the best hope for our culture and its problems is through faith in action. He is a tireless and influential teacher, pastor, speaker, writer, and friend. Leith has been on our campus several times before and has been a true friend and supporter of Northeastern Seminary and Roberts Wesleyan College. His wife, Charlene, is here with us, seated with my wife, Catherine. Charlene, welcome to you. I look forward to hearing today's address from this dear friend, Dr. Leith Anderson, a highly esteemed Christian brother. Please help me Welcome Dr. Anderson to the speaker's podium today. Jesus was a master storyteller. He could mesmerize a crowd and antagonize a critic and challenge a theologian and teach a moral all in the same story. He would speak and he was funny and he was practical. He was profound, all at the same time. So listeners from his first century and listeners from our 21st century, we can all see ourselves in the stories, the parables of Jesus. One of the most famous and familiar of Jesus' stories was recorded by Matthew near the end of the New Testament's first gospel. It's the story about a really rich boss who goes away on a long trip and who entrusts an astonishing amount of money to three carefully chosen employees. The most quoted line from Jesus' famous story says something about being the kind of servant whose work is well done, good and faithful servant. That's the most famous line from that story of Jesus, but it is the least famous line of that story that particularly intrigues me. Jesus begins his story saying that the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. 
And so we hear the story and we immediately think of ourselves. We put ourselves in the story. And we wonder, if we were counted among his employees, how would we be rated on a scale of one to five? How would we manage the money ourselves, especially over a long period of time? Would we be tempted when the boss didn't come back to steal some of it to pay off our debts or to buy something we really want? And those are all really good questions. But one of the questions that come up is, what was this, this talent? It actually was a measure of weight and a measure of money. And it's very difficult to translate from ancient times and places into a modern economy. We think that a talent was about 80 pounds. If that's true and you translate it into today's economy, that's 1,167 troy ounces. And if you look at last week's commodity rates and you say, well, if the talent was made out of silver, then that would be a lot of money. Last week, that would have been about $28,000 per talent. But if it was gold, prices have dropped a lot in recent weeks. It would be about $1.7 million. So the employee who was entrusted with five talents, he had somewhere in the vicinity of $9 million that he was supposed to manage in the absence of the boss. Ah, but it's really hard to stretch our dollars back into their time. So another way of looking at it is to say that one talent was estimated to be 6,000 denarii. That was a denarius, the money of the time. And that a denarius was about a day's wages for the typical labor. If you figure it that way, then a silver talent was about 20 years of wages. And five talents, just in silver, would be a hundred years of salary. So Jesus was playing with their imagination and playing with our imagination because their hearts, like ours, would beat faster at the notion of having an extraordinary amount of money available and to do with it as we decide to do. So you can figure out for yourself, you know, what would you do if you had millions of dollars that were entrusted to you? The boss in Jesus' story distributed this money according to his assessment of the abilities of these employees. They were managers of somebody else's cash. And they were supposed to do it the way the boss wanted it done. So if they figured the boss was a high risk taker, then they should take risks. And if they figured the boss was the kind of person who would put the money under the mattress, then you're supposed to save it and protect the capital. Okay, that's the story. But I told you that I'm most intrigued by the least famous line in Jesus' story. Jesus said, after a long time, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. You know, my prayer for, which I have prayed for all of you in the Roberts Wesleyan class of 2013, is that someday God will say to you, well done. Well done. You've really done well. But it won't be for a long time. So <clears throat> today is commencement day, and you've already been at this for a long time. You've spent a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of money. But the finish line, the finish line, it isn't even in sight. So you, you look at the famous characters of history. Moses, he spent 80 years getting ready, and then in the final 40 years of his life, he led the people of Israel out of slavery into the promised land. 80 years of getting ready. Or Jesus, his time on earth was 33 years, 90% of it was spent in preparation, and three years in public ministry. Or, if you want to come into the last 20th century, perhaps you know the famous quote from the Chinese premier Chou Enlai, who was asked what he thought of the French Revolution of 1789, and he said, it's too soon to say. Because from a Chinese perspective, you look at centuries, you look at it for a long time. It's comparatively easy to be faithful for the short run. It's fun to get off to a really good start. But Jesus has called us to a marathon, not to a sprint. Jesus' story 
leaves plenty of blank space for us to fill in. Space of what we've experienced and space of what we imagine. As President Martin said, I served as pastor of Wooddale Church in suburban Minneapolis for most of my life. And some of those early years were difficult and discouraging. And I will tell you, as a young pastor, I felt like quitting because it seemed unproductive and if maybe even counterproductive. But l let me speed ahead into the 21st century. For a while, I had another job where I gave leadership to Denver Seminary and so would commute on a regular basis between our home in Minneapolis and Denver. And one night on the last flight back to Minneapolis, my wife Charlene and I were on the plane. She was seated at the aisle seat, I was, or at the window seat, I was seated at the aisle seat. And we're all getting settled in. She's over there reading and uh, I was just about ready to fall asleep after a long day of work. When the flight attendant busily was coming by and she just stopped at our seat, turned to Charlene and said, are you reading my favorite book? And somewhat startled, Charlene said, it's a Bible. And the flight attendant said, I know the author. And then with that sort of <clears throat> walked off and went about the rest of her task. So <clears throat> half an hour later, we're in the flight and I am just about asleep and the flight attendant wasn't so busy and she came back and uh, she knelt down in the center aisle and she's talking across me to Charlene and it was very obvious that she was a committed Christian. And they started, you know, the typical conversation, where you're from and all of that. And uh, Charlene said to her, well, wh where do you live? And she said, I live in Loveland, Colorado. And Charlene said, oh, we used to live down the street in Longmont, Colorado. And the flight attendant said, well, where do you live now? And Charlene said, we live in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And the flight attendant said, I used to live in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. So <clears throat> Charlene said to her, well, when you lived in Minnesota, where did you go to church? And the flight attendant said, oh, I went to Wooddale Church and I can still remember the sermons from way back then. Now that kind of got me interested and so I started to wake up a little bit and pay a little more attention and I gave Charlene the look. And I need to explain, I have known her all of my life. Uh, we started dating the month I turned 15 and we, we kind of ran out of things to talk about about 12, 14 years ago. No, not really, but, <laughs> but you know, sometimes we'll walk through a mall and one of us will say, wow, he really looks like, and the other one says, yeah, he really does. Because we went to the same schools, we know the same people, and so I gave her the look, and the look was, don't tell the flight attendant that I'm the pastor, of the child. let's just see where this goes, this is gonna be really interesting. So she said to the flight attendant, all right, before you say anything else, you need to know that he's the pastor at Wooddale Church. <laughs> And the flight attendant, now she's on her knees in the aisle next to me, you know, 12, 18 inches from my face. She looked at me and said, now, this was 25 years ago when Leith Anderson was the pastor at <laughs> Wooddale Church. So let me just tell you, the class of 2013, in 25 years, you're going to look different than you do today. I mean, that's one of the things that sort of happens along the way. And then she told the rest of her story. She said, that she was a rookie flight attendant with Northwest Airlines and she had a long layover at the Minneapolis airport. And she didn't want to stay in the terminal so she went out and she got in her car and just started driving around on a Sunday morning. And she saw a church building. And so she parked her car and she came in. She said she sat in the back. I don't think she was churched at all before that. And she said, I sat there and I listened to the service and the sermon and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she said, and that morning, I decided to follow Jesus, and I've never turned back. And then she went on to tell how she's written booklets that she gives to passengers. She's married a Christian man. She leads a national conference every year of Christian flight attendants. I didn't find out about that for 25 years. I was ready to quit. I was ready to completely give up. But you see, what happened was I just didn't find out for a very long time. John Quincy Adams was the son of the second president of the United States and himself the sixth president of the United States. He had an amazing career. He was a United States minister, or today we would say ambassador, 
to several European countries. He was the Secretary of State before he became the President. As Secretary of State, he negotiated the U.S.-Canadian border. As Secretary of State, he negotiated the annexation of Florida from Spain to the United States. As President, he nearly paid off the national debt and his successor on the basis of what John Quincy Adams had done in terms of the economy did pay off the national debt. But when it came time for him to run for re-election, the people of the United States resoundingly defeated him and chose someone else to be president. It was after losing a second term to the presidency that John Quincy Adams did something that no other president of the United States had ever done before or has ever done since. From his home state of Massachusetts, he ran for the United States House of Representatives, and the former president was a congressman from Massachusetts for 17 years until he died in office. And during those 17 years, Adams became the most articulate voice in Congress against slavery. He proposed bills, most of which were either cut off before debate or defeated. He was an advocate who argued before the Supreme Court of the United States. He gave all kinds of speeches. He introduced a really novel idea into American law. He said, if the country ever comes to a civil war, that the President of the United States, under the War Powers Act, could actually make an announcement and declare that slaves were free. It was a fascinating legal theory that he proposed. And so he became the relentless voice for setting free those who were enslaved. And then he died in an office right off the rotunda of the United States Capitol building. And a committee was appointed in the United States House of Representatives, a committee on arrangements to plan his funeral. To that committee was appointed a freshman congressman from Illinois' 7th District who helped to plan Adams' funeral. Those two members of Congress had only served together less than a year. But the young congressman from Illinois was so impressed by Adams and so well remembered the speeches that he gave against slavery that even though he was himself not reelected to the House of Representatives, the 39-year-old from Illinois had served only one term, but Abraham Lincoln went on to become the 16th President of the United States, and when Civil War broke out, following the advice of John Quincy Adams, he issued 150 years ago the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862. That was more than 14 years after John Quincy Adams had died, but finally, finally, slaves were set free. It took a long time. So class of 2013, you're in this for the distance. God has entrusted you with extraordinary gifts of a college education from a great college and a generation in which there are unprecedented opportunities. And after a long time, God will check back with you to see how you're doing with what has been entrusted to you. And when he does, may he say to you, well done. Every four years, we rehear a story from the 1968 summer Mexico City Olympic Games. It was an arduous Olympics because of the altitude of Mexico City. When the marathon in 1968 was run, there were runners from 75 countries who started the race. Only 57 of them actually finished the race. That's a 34% dropout rate. These are Olympic marathoners who couldn't even finish the race. In 1968, Mamo Woldi of Ethiopia won the gold medal at 2 hours, 20 minutes, 16 seconds. The last to cross the finish line was more than an hour later at 3 hours, 25 minutes, 27 seconds. His name was John Stephen Aquari. He had fallen during the marathon. He had severely cut his leg. He had dislocated the joint. 
he ran in excruciating pain. And when he finally came to the stadium and entered it and approached the finish line, there was hardly anybody left. They had all gone home. He crossed the finish line and a reporter came up to him and asked him why. Why did you keep running? Why didn't you just quit? A lot of people did, and you are so severely injured. Why did you keep running? John Stephen Akwari said, my country, Tanzania, did not send me 10,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 10,000 miles to finish the race. Class of 2013, this is a wonderful day. Into your hands will be placed the parchments of hard-earned degrees. Think of them as the talents that God has given to you, that he has entrusted to you, because he believes in you, because he trusts you, that God will go with you and expect the very best from you. And 10, 20, 50 years from now, after a long time, may Jesus Christ himself say, well done, well done, because God sent you not only to start the race, but to finish it well.